privilege of introducing Melody McGee, who is currently an Aspire Adult Education Instructor in the Columbus City School District. She has served as an adult education instructor in the Franklin County Correctional Center, Career Centers, and Columbus Metropolitan Libraries. She has a diversity of teaching experiences, including being a former lead teacher and curriculum writer for early childhood learning centers, a language arts enrichment lead teacher for an urban community program, and a primary and kindergarten teacher at traditional learning style and alternative literature-based elementary school. Melody received her Bachelor of Science degree in education from Ohio Dominican University and has done graduate studies through Ohio University. She has received awards, including Educator of the Year by the Columbus Council of Parent Teacher Associations for Columbus City Schools, awarded in 2013 through 2014, 2014 through 2015, and 2015 through 2016. She has received Delta Kappa Gamma Educational Foundation Project Awards, receiving grant funds for the projects entitled My Second Time Around, An Adult Learner's Mathematical Journey Continues. Melody presently serves as the Delta Kappa Gamma Ohio State Organization Second Vice President. She has served as the personnel chairman of the Ohio State Organization of the Delta Kappa Gamma Society International from 2018 through 2020. Melody served as the president of the Gamma New Chapter from 2017 through 2020. She has been a proud member of the Delta Kappa Gamma Society International since 2008. She serves in her community as an ordained associate minister in the ministry at Faith Ministries Interdenominational Church in Columbus, Ohio, which includes her leadership as a ministry altar worker, the communion efficient ministry, new members class for children, curriculum writer and facilitator, and the coordinator of the Faith Ministries Encouragement Ministry. That is quite a resume. At this time, I will turn the program over to Melody McGee. Would all participants in this session have in place a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil to complete an activity that we're going to do together? All right, can everybody see me? Good evening, my Delta Kappa Gamma Society, Ohio State Organization sisters. It's a beautiful evening in our Delta Kappa Gamma Society OSO neighborhood. And I'm so glad that we could all be together to Zoom in this session. I want to first thank my presenter, Linda, for my lovely introduction and acknowledge our OSO president, Diana Kirkpatrick, and the executive board, Ohio State Organization. And I also want to thank each of you, my Delta Kappa Gamma Society sisters, for taking the time out of your schedules to share this session with me too. Well, this evening, we're going to discover some tips on teaching students with various backgrounds using the cultural responsive teaching approach.
During this session, we're going on a journey to explore the definition of culturally responsive teaching, the power of self-reflection, the culturally responsive teaching approach to learning, the components of culturally responsive teaching, the differences between equality and equity, cultural promising practices, goals for learners in their classroom environments, the iceberg of cultures, examples of criteria objectives, lesson plan idea rubrics for instructors to use to demonstrate cultural competencies, an example of a performance evaluation assessment tool, and some additional teaching strategies, examples. And then finally, we're going to conclude by asking each of you some questions about how can you create a classroom environment for students that is culturally responsive? Let's begin by exploring the definition of cultural, culturally responsive teachers. Culturally responsive teaching is an approach that encompasses and recognizes both students and educators, lived experiences, culture, and different language resources. Culturally responsive educators reflect on their students as well as their own lived experiences, culture, and different language resources to inform, support, and ensure high quality instruction and promote effective information processing. We move now to the power of self-reflection. Our culture shapes our values, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. It is an essential part of who we are and how we identify ourselves. Our culture molds our experiences and how we interpret defining moments in our lives. The power of self-reflection is a tool that is used to reflect on a type of self-examination about how you view yourself when you look in a mirror and how you view others. Do you have that pencil and paper or pen nearby? We're going to answer some self-reflection questions together. So let's number that paper one through 10 and let's skip some spaces in between. As we think about self-reflection, we might answer a few questions or statements to discover some insights about ourselves. Are you ready? Here we go. Question number one. You're just going to respond by writing down the answer. Here we go. Where were you born? And where did you grow up? Question number two. What year were you born? Now, I promise I won't tell anybody and you don't have to reveal it to anybody. Question number three, what foods do you enjoy eating? Question number four, how many people were in your immediate family and lived in your home when you grew up? Question number five, complete this statement. I am blank. Question number six. 
Question number six, what racial group do you identify with? Question number seven, have you ever been excluded from a group? Question number eight, what kinds of music do you like? Question number nine, what type of language or languages do you speak? And question number 10, what do you know about other cultures? If we had time to put you in group chat rooms to share your responses to these questions, some of them would be similar because of your experiences, while others might be very different because of your own life memories and recollections, your living environments, your various backgrounds, your cultural heritages, your religious beliefs, the locations where you lived, your ages, and your views about others around you. Uh-oh, just a minute. It looks like I'm receiving a reminder from my very own self-reflection mirror. It's reminding me about a cultural responsive event from the past that changed my view and perspective and knowledge about one of my students, family's environment and cultural custom traditions. This experience was something that I had not grown up with in my family home. It was something that my courses in college had not prepared me for. It took me out of my comfort zone. And it was one of my first encounters with a fleeing, disappearing family. Come travel with me back in time to my second year teaching experience. It was on the west side of Columbus, Ohio. It was in a low income school district in an Appalachian community. Many students moved from one school to another, sometimes even overnight, depending on their financial challenges, issues of domestic and child abuse, lack of food in the home, loss of utilities being turned off in their homes, loss of jobs, some people in their families and in homes faced eviction notices and became homeless very quickly. One of my students, who was a very sweet little girl, would come in every day crying and not wanting to leave her mommy. Her brother was a fourth grader. This would go on every day for weeks. That meant from the time school started back in August all the way through the fall. And I tried everything. I didn't understand what was happening when she was absent even for three whole months. I didn't understand why some of that population would on the west side of town was known to do at that time. But soon I found out that some families would flee 
to the back hills of West Virginia in what they called camouflage to different relatives' homes for months at a time until a crisis was calmed down or in some cases eliminated. Now this little girl didn't return to my class until early spring, but when she did, her personality was totally changed. She hugged me and didn't want to let go. She was no longer crying. She could hardly wait to see her classmates and, and wanted to talk to them and hug them too. She was like night and day. She even didn't cry and hold on to her mama. So I approached mom and welcomed her back to our first grade family and told her that I was so glad to see her and, and, and so glad that her daughter was back again too. And do you know what the mom said? She told me now everything was just fine. So the bell rang, mom smiled at the daughter and she waved goodbye to her and the daughter simply waved back goodbye to the mom and of course, I was totally shocked by the way they said goodbye to each other based on the way that they had done in the past. Now, a little later that morning, the little girl climbed up into my lap after I finished reading to a small group of children. And she explained to me why she always cried for her mama when she was getting ready to leave. She told me that her father would always come home drunk every evening and she would beat up, he would beat up her mother. Not only would he beat up the mother severely, he would drag the mother up and down the steps with her beautiful long black hair. The mom's black hair went all the way past down down her back, beautiful thick black hair. But that's not only what they heard. The little brother and the little girl would have to be, they would be told to hide in the attic in boxes that were filled with old blankets. And they were told to stay there and they would have to hide there all night and they would listen to all this abuse going on all night. They would have to remain totally quiet so that the father would not find them. But she told me now they were able to come back to their home because he was never going to hurt their mama again. And she told me the reason why was because their kin saw to that. As you think about your own self-reflection experiences, let me leave you with this quote by Robert L. Rosen, who said, self-reflection entails asking yourself questions about your values, assessing your strengths and failures, thinking about your percept perceptions and interactions with others and imagining where you want to take your life in the future. Classroom teachers, school administrators, and decision makers bring their cultural experiences and perspectives into their everyday decisions and actions. And so do students from various ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Culturally responsive teaching acknowledges that different heritages and languages affect students' attitudes and approaches towards learning. Cultural education is a movement designed to empower all students to become knowledgeable, caring and active citizens.
The components of culturally responsive teaching includes self-awareness, student awareness, learning partnerships and relationships, community building, representation, and student collaboration and conversations. Under the category of self-awareness, it means having the ability to look within yourself, to get a clear view of your thoughts, beliefs, emotions, motivations, and feelings. And you use that knowledge from your own culture to enrich teaching and learning. Under the category of student awareness, it includes that instructors have a belief that all students can learn. That they can, uh, the instructors can also develop differentiated curricula and then understand that, that instructors can have diversity as well as understanding that students developmentally can also take risks. Under the category of learning partnerships and relationships, it includes positive perspectives and communications between parents and their families. It provides students-centered learning opportunities and culturally mediated instruction. Under the category of community building, it includes flexible teaching and learning time resources. It includes team building exercises and block time teaching, homework clubs, multi-looping class environments before and after school programs and team discipline opportunities. Under the category of representation, that includes that all ethnic and racial groups should be included in learning opportunities. They should have diverse libraries and media and learning stations within their environments. They should have cultural displays and they should collect and maintain a variety of diverse literature that is written by different authors from various cultures. Under the category of student collaboration and conversation, that includes flexible grouping of students, cooperative learning experiences and learning stations and centers. They should have tiered assignments and also literature circles. A culturally responsive teaching environment contains knowledge of students. The instructor demonstrates familiarity with students' backgrounds, knowledge, and experiences. The instructor knows the learner, knows as much as possible about their students, including their learning styles, their pace, their multiple intelligences, their personal qualities, such as their personal temperament, what motivates them, personal interest, potential disabilities and their health needs, their family circumstances and background and language preferences. The instructor develops an instructional plan, including an accurate analysis of the student's developmental needs. And the teacher or the instructor develops a quality curriculum for each learner. The curriculum needs to be interesting to the students and relevant to their lives. It should be focused on concepts and principles and not just facts. The classroom environment includes the instructor having and demonstrating a positive rapport and respect for and with all students. These slides show the differences between equality and equity. Sometimes these two terms are thought to be interchangeable or thought to be the same. Let's explore the differences though between the two. 
Let's start with equality. The definition of equality means that each individual or group of people are given the same resources or opportunities. Now we can see even though each person has the same crate of the same height to stand on, it proves unequal access to the same view of the game. It's great for this person who's on the left side because of his height, but it wasn't for the same person on the right because he was so short and he still can't see over the top of the fence. He can only see through the fence, his little gap. Now equity on the other hand, equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates the exact resources and opportunities needed for each person and for an equal outcome. The equitable solution allocates the resources that each person needs to be able to have the same amount of you, given what each person needs to raise them to the same level of access to viewing the game. Dr. Nahid Dasani wrote, equality is giving everyone a shoe. Equity is giving everyone a shoe that fits. The perspective promising practices of the culturally responsive environment includes preparing students for social cultural difficulties. It includes having high expectations of students. It includes seeing students as capable and resilient. It includes using curriculum that connects the students' lives and goals. It includes engaging students in active learning to allow for dialogue and conversation. It includes designing cooperative learning activities so that it's full of participation for everyone. It includes recognizing students' perspectives. And it also includes modeling interest and respect for differences. Some goals of a culturally competent classroom should include that all students have equal opportunity to succeed. All students can express themselves freely and openly. All students can relate, can be who they are. All students can relate to the content of the class. All students are respected, all students feel safe, and all students can learn. We are now going to look at some iceberg of culture elements. We can kind of think of these as the tip of the iceberg, as well as beneath the iceberg elements. Some things that we typically can see that are the tip of the iceberg or on top of the iceberg are some elements that you are probably well known to most people about different cultures awareness. For example, on the tip of the iceberg or things that we probably notice the most about different cultures are first languages. I bet most of you have heard languages from different cultures being around you. And I bet some of you can probably speak different language from different cultures. And I also bet most of you have either tasted food or cooked food from different cultures or even smelled food from different cultures. Some of you may have gone to restaurants and tasted foods from different cultures. These are things that most people are aware of. Some of you have even observed people dress or attire from different cultures as well as worn attire from different cultures. Some of you have read or seen different documents of literature from different cultures. Maybe you've even gotten to go to a drama or a theater presentation about a different culture. 
Then there are those festivals. Those festivals, I'm sure if you've gone to them, you've heard classical or popular music from different cultures. And then you may have viewed games or, or sports events, or maybe even played different sports or looked at different documentaries about sports from different cultures. But then there's some, some different cultural elements or things that you might not really think about that are called what I call under the iceberg or things that you might not think about. Like for example, the notion of modesty. You might not know about in some cultures what they consider something of being modest. Maybe some kind of clothing that they would be wearing or maybe some type of way that they would be speaking to each other or their ideas about how they would be rearing children in different cultures might be different from the way that you were brought up or how you reared your own children. Then there's that wonderful thing about cleanliness. Sometimes people from different cultures have different smells than we have, or they don't wash their clothing as many times as we do, or they decide that they are not going to use what we call deodorant. Those are different things from other cultures that are different from ours. Um, what about the meaning of language? Our wonderful English language, not only do we pronounce our, our words sometimes differently than they would, but the meanings behind them. Some of our words have the same sound, the same way that we pronounce them, but they have different meanings. And their meanings to our language might be totally different from ours. Then there's the body language. The body language that we have and the body language that they might have from their culture could be totally different and misinterpreted by the way our views would be. And maybe our view of the way that we would present body language might be misinterpreted to also them. So that's a difference that we might not be aware of. Then there's those wonderful facial expressions. Of course, now we can't really tell what the facial expressions are because we wear those what? Wonderful mask on our face. So all we're depending on now is what? Those eyes. But then when we get to seeing those eyes, that eye behavior, sometimes different cultures, they have a way of looking down when they're speaking to you. And sometimes in our culture, we think in order for us to be able to get a full understanding of our students or if they understand you need to look me in the eye. But in some cultures, that might be a sign of disrespect. So we have to keep that in mind when we're dealing with other cultures, as well as how they relate to the different sexes. Sometimes if you're dealing with a male from a different culture, culture and you're a female, oh, you have to be careful how you approach them or how if you would extend a hand, they will not shake your hand or if you should touch a female or if you should not touch a female from different cultures. So these are all things that you need to be conscious of when you are approaching or if you are talking on the phone or sending an email or a letter. These are things that you need to be aware of from different cultures when you are conversing with them, when you are approaching them, when you're seeing them. Their different backgrounds may be different from yours. So you might offend them or you might think they're offending you, but it's just a matter of a different culture and a different approach to different things and different views. We move now to the cultural competency ru rubric for instructors in the classroom. This is important because when you get ready for your evaluation, you need to be aware of the cultural competencies and what they mean for you to set up your lesson plan and also how you will be evaluated to get your very best, um, what I wanna say, your very best outcome for your evaluation. So here we go. The criteria objectives under the content integration would mean that the teacher includes content from a variety of cultures and group. That means that if she was going to include a lesson about this area, she might choose 
to integrate and use curriculum content that is representative of different language, cultures, and values if she was going to approach a content integration lesson plan. If the instructor was going to use the category or criteria of knowledge construction, the teacher would be helping the student to understand and explore how culture, ethnicity, gender, race, age, religion would influence information. An example of a lesson that she could include could be helping students identify how their own perspective is influenced by culture, ethnicity, and gender. Now, if the teacher was going to be using the criteria objective, equity pedagogy, she would be teaching using a wide variety of strategies to enable students from diverse racial groups and genders to achieve. A lesson that she might be developing would be leveraging students and families' experiences and encouraging their involvement to enhance learning. If she was developing a lesson about prejudice reduction, the teacher would be maintaining an atmosphere of respect and appreciation for multicultural diversity in the classroom. A lesson that she might develop would be modeling an interest in diverse backgrounds and a willingness to learn from others. Now, this is an example of the State of Ohio Department of Education Performance Evaluation Rubric Assessment Tool. Now, the unit that we're looking at is cultural inclusion. And that means it promotes laws and policies that ensure cultural participation, access, and the right to express and interpret culture. So that's what cultural inclusion is meaning. Now, the category that this instructor would be evaluated on would be differentiation practice using cultural inclusion. Now, differentiated practice includes the learning environment. And that means the students of differentiated abilities, learning needs and levels of academic achievement will be grouped together in this environment. And the instructor would use a wide variety of teaching techniques and strategies when developing lessons to use and instruct these diverse groups of students with a diverse group of learning needs. If we look from the far right and go all the way back, we can see what the different categories that the employee would be receiving as far as their rating. The first, which is to the far right, would be the accomplished rating. The next would be skilled, the next would be developing, and last would be ineffective. Let me share with you what they mean. If the re re instructor received the following rating of accomplished, and that's the highest one, that would mean, and it would be reflected, that the professional supported diverse populations by usually utilizing culturally relevant practices to treat constituents with fairness, respect, and support. The professional successfully empowers constituent growth. When she was evaluated using the differentiated practices in working with students while demonstrating the use of cultural inclusion in their learning environments. Now, we move now to the skilled rating. And it reflected that the professional supports diverse populations by utilizing culturally relevant practices to treat constituents with fairness, respect, and support. When she was evaluated using the differentiated practices and working with students while demonstrating the use of cultural inclusion in their learning environments. 
if the person, the employee, received the following rating of developing. The professional reflected that the professional supports diverse populations by consistently treating constituents with fairness, respect, and support. When she was evaluated using the differentiated practices and working with students while demonstrating the use of cultural inclusion in their learning environments. But if the instructor received the following rating of ineffective, that meant that her work re reflected that the professional cannot identify the strategies to support diverse populations when she was evaluated using the differentiated practices in working with students while demonstrating the cultural inclusion in their learning environments. Doesn't that make you want to go back and get evaluated? Some resources of teaching strategy examples are seven ways to support diversity in your schools. And then there's some culturally relevant teaching strategies examples. Let me share with you just a few. One of the ways to support diversity in your schools is to examine your teaching materials. Is your literature in your classroom diverse? When class, classroom materials present a wide range of voices, Students learn more about the world around them and think differently. Here's another one. Connect with parents in your community. Tell parents about your goals for diversity in your classroom. Reach out to leaders in the community that can offer different perspectives and connect students to the rest of the community and the schools. Support professional development opportunities. Research organizations and programs that offer diversity, specific courses, and encourage teachers to develop their own skills individually so that they can respond effectively to classroom challenges. And then some culturally relevant teaching strategies and examples might be learning about your students. Open communication should uncover your students' learning styles. Distribute surveys and questionnaires and whole class discussions. Here's another suggestion. Using learning stations, provide a wide range of material by setting up learning stations. And one more, establish cooperative based groups. Schedule meeting times and make agendas for groups of three to four students, allowing them to review lessons and answer each other questions. Then there's a wonderful website called Thrively. And this website will help students to discover their own unique strengths, interests, and aspirations. And they can build their skills they need for the classroom and beyond. I'm gonna share with you a quick advertisement about Thrively and see if you will enjoy possibly learning a little bit more about it and how it can be used by students. Here we go. From the moment we opened the Design 39 campus here in San Diego, we knew we were doing something revolutionary. As the founding principal, I knew we needed a platform to help make our vision of personalized learning a reality. We found Thrively. Thrively is a personalized learning platform that develops the whole child. It brings together four key components that are essential for personalized learning. Self-awareness, finding purpose, building grit, and creating impact. Thrively built the industry's first strength assessment measuring 23 strength areas including resilience, leadership, creative thinking, and more. It takes 30 to 40 minutes to complete and every student will receive a profile that is positive and uplifting. You will see the whole child and your students will use it as a springboard to greater self-awareness. Best of all, research shows that students are 30 times more engaged when their educators know their strengths. The next step is to help students find purpose. Thrively's pathways make career exploration fun and accessible with informative and inspirational videos that can bring careers to life. 
activity recommendations show students what they can do right now in their local community. We know that students who believe that IQ grows and persists through challenges are proven to find success. That's why schools use Thrive Blaze values and skills to build grit and growth mindset in students. Students build enduring values like grit, gratitude, self-awareness, and purpose. They also participate in online exercises that inspire social impact and expose kids to the four C's. As students identify their passions, teachers create hands-on real-world learning experiences to bring those interests to life. Thrively Projects allows teachers to develop student-centered learning by enabling you to create genius hour, innovation, and passion projects. Group students by interest and keep all your project communications and resources in one place. Students will solve real world problems and get hands on experiences. With Thrively, Design 39 teachers have immersed themselves and their students in this new paradigm of education. All the resources they need to unlock the genius of each child is at their fingertips. After my retirement, I joined Thrively as their head of classroom innovation, as I believe in their vision of personalized learning to help every educator maximize the learning of every student so they can thrive in life. So join the 20,000 educators that are using Thrively to personalize learning. Go to www.thrively.com forward slash classroom and sign up today. Looking forward, how can I create a classroom environment that is culturally responsible? Responsive. Under the category of self student awareness, ask yourself the question, who are my students? What are their backgrounds, their learning styles, their interests, their culture? Under the category of learning partnerships and relationships, Ask yourself the question, how can I build relationships with my students and family? Under the category of community building, ask yourself the question, how can I help my students build positive relationships with each other? Under the category of student collaboration and conversations, ask yourself the question, how can I provide opportunities for my students to work together and have conversations? And under the category of representation, ask yourself the question, how can I represent my students in my physical classroom and end my lessons? In closing, the major goal of the cultural responsive teaching approach in learning is that all students will acquire the knowledge, attitudes, and skills needed to function in an ethnically and racially diverse nation and world. I thank you for sharing this session with me this evening, reflecting on the culturally responsive teaching approach to learning. This is my contact information. If you would like any further information, I am actively serving as your DKG, Delta Kappa Gamma, Ohio State Organization, second vice president. And I am a proud member of the Gamma New Chapter in Columbus, Ohio. Thanks, Melody. Are there any questions from anybody? She loves to answer questions, I do know that. No questions? She answered them all? Well, I have one, Melody. How hard or how difficult? We have school districts that have curriculum directors and they pretty much dictate, you know, they adopt uh, a certain curriculum. How easy is it to put diversity into that? 
Well, I think it would depend on the, the principal too, to uh, help or how much he or she would like to develop or to put into that. Um, I think that the classroom teacher could do a little of that herself or himself, but I think it's the commitment too of the whole team wanting to use that strategy. There are certain things, again, that the instructor themselves can do, but I think overall that the, also the leadership has to also approach it too. And it's, it has to be important to them also. Yeah, everybody has to buy into it, don't they? Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Linda, you can unmute. Thank you. Um, I do uh, student observations for Ohio Christian University. And uh, the philosophy out there is developmentally appropriate education. And this is huge, the differentiation and um, knowing your students and meeting the needs of your students, it's huge. I'm wondering, is that the case in most universities in their student teacher training? Do you know I, anything about that? I really don't know. I, I really don't know because I'm not really active in the university area. Uh, I just deal with the adult ed and I have teachers uh, who are in the lower levels, you know, like uh, elementary, middle, and high school, but again, I don't have that information about the, the universities. What do you see with the, the younger teachers coming in? Do they have, do you notice that background? Yes, yes, that's something that they really are pushing in the Columbus district, are making sure that they have that covered in their classrooms and they are evaluated very, um, very much in that area. And that's something that is covered and they look for when they're going into those environments. So yes, that's something that is very much, and that's why I cover that uh, because that's something that is looked for in that the, uh, when they're looking at the evaluation, they are looking very much to see that every um, culture is included and they are looking to make sure that that's, that's something that the instructor is really taking the time to intentionally um, right. do in the classroom, it's not by accident, but do they really understand and are they making a connection with? They also have tried to uh, put out different uh, webinars as well as workshops to encourage the different populations to be included and for the employees to come and take advantage of those so they can connect and let their understanding be known for the different cultures. Uh, we have within our district uh, the, the different schools that deal with just the populations from uh, different uh, cultures, but they are still immersed in every pocket of every school. So for that reason, just to have them to have a special quote unquote place for them to, to be focused on individually, they are in different pockets of different schools. So they wanted to include as many educators as possible for them to come in to understand the different backgrounds so that when they have something like, for example, Ramadan, when some of the children or the students aren't able to eat, uh, they understand if they get a little testy uh, because they haven't eaten all day <clears throat> because of Ramadan, they're not able to eat until the evening time. So. Uh, if, if they are a certain age. So for that reason, uh, they're a little upset uh, or, or maybe you know their stomachs are growling um, because of the fact that others around them ha have eaten lunch or breakfast or whatever the case may be. So you have to understand the different cultures or, or different things that are going on. If, if you had a child who was uh, of another culture and if they had to miss school because of a religion uh, or you know some type of a meeting or something that was going on, you have to understand that. So again, under, understanding it, acknowledging it. Uh, I had a, a student, I had students uh, within my class because uh, I'm an adult ed teacher who uh, had to pray at a certain time every day. And uh, this was a, a, I guess not an issue, but a concern with a lot of our, our instructors because they would leave right in the middle of a class. 
And sometimes they would be gone for a while and they would play, pray, of course, in a certain spot within the hallway. So I knew this before I, I accepted the, the teaching of this class and I had quite a few people who would have been leaving. Well, this is what I did. I put my uh, time for my break at the exact same time that they would be praying. But this is the, the thing that I did. I only had a five minute break so that it would not interrupt what my lesson plan was. So they did not want to miss what was going to happen right after my break. So they actually prayed very quickly in the classroom, very, very quickly all together. If you can imagine all these mats on the floor in the same space, praying as fast as they could because at that five minute thing, I didn't have a timer, but I just looked at the, clap, the clock and I always knew I was going to do something really great that they really wanted to hear. And that's when I would start the next part of it. And I said, now we're ready to begin with the song. So you should have seen them getting up as fast as they could. And I had all my colleagues were saying, you're ingenious. How did you do that? They didn't even leave the room. I said, oh, because the next, the, whatever the next thing was, they really wanted to hear. And so they didn't want to miss it. So yes, they got to pray. Yes, I was very respectful of their need, but at the same time, they were also respectful of mine. But I got something, I made it so relevant and something that they really wanted to, to hear, something that was very relevant to them. So they still got to do their prayer. They still got to, to be mindful. They knew that I was respecting them, but at the same time, it was good for me. It was good for them. And, but it was, it was something because my director came by and he, the first day, he said, what is going on in there? They were just going up and down and up and down as fast as you can imagine and saying what, whatever their prayers were, but they didn't leave the classroom and they did it very quickly because they only had five minutes because I had to start the rest of my class. So they missed nothing. And, and it, was, it was just something, but that's the way that I, I um, adapted to what they needed and they adapted to what, what my lesson plan was. So that's the way I, I handled that, that situation. Hey, Melody, uh, Hannah Fairbanks has a couple questions for you. Hi, Melody. One of the questions was, is there a cost for that program that you talked about, the Thrively? The, Thri the Thrively, I believe it's, a, um, it's free of charge to join. Um, you can get on there though and look. Okay. Uh, I'm sure that they're probably loaded into to some cost if you know you're going to develop it and uh, the the testing procedures and all this other stuff too. I'm sure there's something, but it's free to join, so you okay. can go there and look at that. Okay. Another um, question I had is: Have you followed the the new um, the in statement of the new mayor of Boston and followed her background? No, and, um, she was on the news yesterday and she was one of the first children that was actually part of the desegregation process. Okay. The, the cross city busing and she was talking about it. So it was very moving. And I, I can't believe that we as we as educators went through that and have come out so positively on the other side. So that was that was another thing I thought. Um, I also did, um, I did what they called the, it was the, called the Columbus Plan when I was in, um, what I was, a middle school and high school. It would take me two hours to get to a middle school. And I would get up in the morning about 5.30, leave on the bus. I would get there to the bus stop about 5.30 and we would leave at six o'clock. And I would not get to my destination. I would have to change buses in downtown Columbus at a major high school. And then I would get to my destination about 8, 815. So I did that going and coming to uh, my parents wanted me to have the best education possible. And at that time they had the segregation going with the busing. And so I was one of the first ones to take advantage of that. So I did that for middle school as well as high school. And it was a wonderful opportunity because it did uh, get me out of the neighborhood environment that I was in. And it did propel me to have a very wonderful, I feel well-rounded education and provided me to get into the college experience that I really wanted to be in. 
So for that, I was a part of, of something very similar to that. It took a lot of time and energy and effort, I'm sure, for them to make that choice and decision because it was very difficult to go all the way across town and then have to turn around and come all the way home for two hours on the bus. And to be a part of anything that was extracurricular, they did not provide the busing. So my parents had to, to get me there and back. So that was something, especially when I was in high school and doing marching band and getting there and back, they had to do that. But I was able to do four years of it. Uh, but um, I mean, and I was part of the theater production and again, having to stay after school, they did not provide a bus to get you back and forth. So they had to provide that, that those opportunities for me. But I feel it was well worth it because I got to, to take advantage of those things. She was part of the desegregation where uh, rocks were thrown through the bus windows and a very moving piece was on TV last night about her. So we as educators ought to read up or look at it. And I think it was on MSNBC, um, Rachel Maddox show, I think. Hmm. So. I'll have to look at that. Any other questions for our expertise here tonight? Well, Melody, thank you so much. And I, I truly believe in diversity. Um, just as we do in um, OSO and Delta Kappa Gamma. And the more we can um, put it in the forefront, the better off I think we all will be. So thank you again so much. I want to remind I all of you. I have a question. I have a question. <laughs> okay, Kathy, I'm sorry. Didn't mean that's, to ignore that's you. All right. you. You've talked about the diversity with the children and working with the children. Do they work with the diversity with the teaching staff as well, trying to, to build diversity within the staffs? They have, again, they've provided workshops with that. They've done, in, in my department, they've done team building exercises with us. I think that for my department, it's, it's pretty good. I think that we operate as a family. We understand each other uh, pretty well. And uh, if from my background in my department, things are going well within our, our department. So yeah. yeah. Do they try to hire teachers from other cultures and other backgrounds as well? Well, in my in adult ed, I would say that depending on who applies is who would probably uh, get the job. It's pro what I call, it's pretty much a closed shop in that we have a nursing department that is, is, well, of course you have to have a nursing degree in order to get in. It's primarily female, uh, but there's, it's, uh, it's a, I, I would say that there would be 50-50, if I could say that. There's a lot of uh, I would say there's some that are Asian. There are some in there that are African. There are some that are Caucasian that are on the, in the nursing department. In the adult ed, the ESL, I would say we have a couple who are Hispanic. Uh, we have mostly though that are Caucasian. In the Aspire, which is the GED, they call it Aspire, the HSE program. I would say the majority are Caucasian. There are not a lot that are African-American uh, instructors at this time. Uh, also at this time, we are going through a problem with a lot of our students are taking the jobs that nobody else wants to take. So we are, have a lack of students that are coming through our department right now because they are taking the what we call the essential jobs that a lot of people do not want to take. So we have a low enrollment right now for the first time in history because they are taking the jobs that nobody else wants. And believe it or not, a lot of employers used to say, do you have a high school diploma? They don't care now. They're just hiring and hiring and hiring just for the fact that they want these jobs filled. Amazon is one of those people, uh, that, that company that are just hiring, 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 and they're not requiring a high school diploma. Whereas UPS uh, used to 
make sure that the person had or was going to be receiving one that they were enrolled in uh, our program. But now that's not the important thing. They just want the jobs filled. And unfortunately right now with uh, a lot of the human resources and job and family services, they want proof that the person is, is either looking for a job or has some type of employment, be it part-time or whatever, in order for them to get their resource checks. So our right now, our department is hurting as far as we used to have a, a overabundance of people who are needing their HSE, their high school equivalencies. However, the ESL, they're full because a lot of them want, of course, to have their their uh, certificates and be able to get their wonderful citizenship requirements necessary to become citizens of the United States. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Hannah, did you have another question? I just had another statement for people to know. Um, to increase the diversity in the teaching staff, Akron City Schools are doing a grow your own program where they're actually training from within um, and, and educating the, the staff that want, would like to become teachers. It's a brand new program and it's being worked with through ODE. And it sounds really exciting to create the diversity we need in, in the teaching field. So just, to, just a for your information. Uh, Suzanne had asked a question, does DKG have an equity, diversity, and inclusion policy or statement? I am barely sure we do. I'll look it up, uh, Susan, and I'll get back with you, okay? Thank you. I looked, I looked, I've looked on the website and I haven't seen it in a prominent place. There, um, that was a for convention. That was one of their main themes was diversity uh, for the virtual. Well, whether it was going to be face to face or virtual, but there was a lot of discussion on diversity uh, for the international convention last summer. Oh, well, that's good. Okay, I think. If there are no further questions, I um, want to remind all of you to make sure that you have signed in to chat your first and last name and your chapter. Um, there's also time to sign up for Tuesday's session. Next week, it is going to be Zen Tangle. It's an encore. We've had it once before and I see a couple of you smiling that were there the last time and produce some beautiful, if you don't think you can draw, I can guarantee you will produce something beautiful at Zentangle. So uh, look into it, we would love to have you there. Um, the link will be sent out in an e-blast um, this Saturday, so look for that. Um, and it's also on our website. Uh, thank all of you for coming and spending the evening with us. Uh, hope to see you all again very, very soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Melody. Thanks, Thank Melody. You. Thanks, Diana. They all disappear. Hey, Joan, you can unmute now. <laughs> She's trying to figure out unmute. She's trying to figure it out. I'm in. <laughs> Yay. My little wow. board wouldn't come up.